Hello, my name is Greg Dunning and I'm a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Memorial University. My specialty is determining the age of crystallization of rocks and today I'm going to uh, take you through the labs, describe the procedures from start to finish and show you how we do this. Isotopes are separate atoms of the same element which differ in the number of neutrons in the nucleus but have the same number of protons which is what makes it a certain element. Certain isotopes of elements are radioactive and decay at a set rate governed by what's called the decay constant to a final stable isotope of another element. So ones that are used in geology include the rubidium to strontium isotopic system, potassium decaying to make the element argon, samarium decaying to produce the element neodymium, and uranium decaying to produce the element lead. The, the special case of uranium lead dating of rocks, which is what we do in our lab, is uh, because there are two isotopes of uranium with masses 238 and 235, and each of them is radioactive and decays at a separate rate to a separate isotope of lead. Uranium-238 decays to produce lead-206, and uranium-235 decays to produce lead-207. So this system is unique in that we have two chemically identical isotopic systems which are totally separate, and uranium decays to produce lead at different rates in each. So we can determine two ages for one mineral and compare them to each other. And if the two ages are the same, that is a very good check that the age is correct, and there's been no disturbance of the system. The procedure to determine the age of the rock actually should begin in the field where the student or the mapping geologist figures out the relationships of the rocks and produces a map of them and then selects the best sample to determine ages to figure out the geological history of the area. So then when the mapping is done they collect say, a 20 kilogram rock sample or it's usually almost a meat bucket full of rock and bring it back to the lab. We then start by washing it and then we crush it to chip size in a, a crusher that's much like those used in a mine. And then we pulverize it to a powder, which is sort of the consistency of baking flour. Then we pan that powder on a panning table to separate only certain minerals that we're going to want to look at and analyze and wash away most of the sample off this panning table. We then have a concentrate of dense minerals, which include those we can date, that are maybe a few hundred grams left of the 20 kilogram rock. Now we have to separate each mineral from the other because we're going to look for the mineral zircon, which when it crystallizes takes uranium into its structure and therefore is a mineral we can determine the age. And we do this by separating them according to their density by passing them through a very dense liquid and the dense minerals sink and the light minerals float. And then we pass it through a magnetic field on a separator that passes the minerals on a trough through a dense magnetic field and separates minerals according to their iron content, their magnetic susceptibility. At the end of this process, we usually have a few milligrams or 10, 20 milligrams in some rocks of the mineral zircon and have removed essentially all other minerals from this concentrate that we got from panning. We then take those minerals and select the very highest quality ones that look the most like gems, beautiful like, not diamond shaped, but prisms that are very high luster under a, a microscope. We do this under alcohol so they don't blow away in the wind and with using uh, jeweler's tweezers to select individual crystals. And we pick say 40 or 50 of those to process further. We want to see the inside structure of the mineral to see if there's any older nuclei on which the later zircon crystallized or is it entirely a homogeneous uh, single generation crystal. So we take some crystals and we mount them in epoxy and we polish them down to the center of the crystals to examine them with a scanning electron microscope. With the scanning electron microscope uh, firing an electron beam at the mineral and mapping it, we can see the internal crystal structure and see if it grew just as one layer on top of another on top of another to the current size, or whether there's internal disturbances. Was it partially corroded and new material grow? And then it was partially corroded and new material grow. 
So you can see that easily in the images from the scanning electron microscope. So we select the simplest crystals with the simplest crystallization history, and then we take them to a chemistry lab that when all the air and all the water and acids are filtered and distilled so that it's clean of lead. The whole environment of the lab is clean of lead. Then we wash the crystals in distilled acids and we place them in Teflon capsules with hydrofluoric acid. And we put that in an oven at 200 degrees centigrade for three days. And in the oven, in this pressurized Teflon capsule in hydrofluoric acid, the entire crystal dissolves. And when we take it out and open the capsule, uh, we have a clear solution, no crystals left. That clear solution contains all the elements that were in the mineral zircon, which are silicon, zirconium, rare earth elements, and uranium and lead. We spend a day, uh, usually doing six samples at a time, passing them through a procedure called ion exchange chemistry. It's a bit like the chemical filters that you would get in a Brita Walter filter, for example. We pass this clear solution through this uh, ion exchange column filled with a resin and by changing the composition of the water or the acid through, that we pass through the resin after we put the sample in, we can wash certain elements away out of the column while the resin chemically bonds to other elements and holds them in the column. So by a simple design of the chemical uh, steps, we remove silicon, zirconium, and the rare earth elements, and through all of that, the lead and uranium are held on the ion exchange column. So everything else is washed away, and the column is only holding the uranium and lead. Then, at the last step, we have a clean sample beaker, a small one, and we wash water through the column, and water removes every element from the, this resin. However, the only elements left to wash out are lead and uranium, so in the beaker, we're collecting absolutely purified lead and uranium, and all the other elements are removed. So we dry this down on a hot plate to a single drop, and that single drop now would contain 10 to 100 picograms of lead, and a picogram is 10 to the minus 12 grams, so this is a tiny, tiny amount of lead from that crystal of zircon. So now we have a beaker with all the lead and uranium in it from one zircon crystal or sometimes two zircon crystals dissolved together. We have to measure this lead and uranium. We have to measure the ratio of the isotopes of the lead and the ratio of the isotopes of the uranium to calculate an age. We have to know how much lead is there and how much uranium is there. We add a special solution with a purified non-natural lead isotope that we can add a known amount to the sample before we measure it. And that is our calibration. We don't know how much of the lead of each isotope was present in the zircon, but we do know the exact amount of this unnatural lead isotope, which has the mass 205, that we've added to the sample. So we take this now to the analytical instrument we're going to use to measure the ratios, which is a mass spectrometer, because we're measuring masses, different masses of the element lead, mass 204, 206, 207, and 208. And 206 and 207, remember, are the two masses of lead that were each produced by decay of uranium. So in the mass spectrometer, we load the sample on a single ribbon of a very high temperature uh, metal, rhenium, and we, it's attached to electrical contacts, and we load that in a sample chamber and the electrical contacts are make contact with uh, others in the sample chamber, which is pumped down to very high vacuum. So there's no oxygen, no nitrogen, no atmosphere in it. When you do that, you can heat the ribbon of rhenium on which the sample has been deposited up to 1500 degrees centigrade without it melting. And when you heat the ribbon up to that high temperature, the drop that we've placed on this filament um, it's evaporated, of course, but the lead ionizes. The lead loses an electron, becomes a lead plus one ion, and suddenly now these are ions, charged ions, not um, atoms, not neutral atoms. 
but we focus them with a set of electrical lenses. So the series of lenses is much like the series of optical lenses in a camera, that there's a series of them with different um, spacings and different charges applied, and as the ions pass through them, they're focused into a single beam of ions. These are accelerated down a flight tube by a very high voltage difference, and this, the, it's called a flight tube. It's a, it's a vacuum chamber, but now it's a narrow tube and this narrow tube uh, enters a very powerful electromagnet, which has got a slot in the middle through which the tube passes. And in a magnetic field, this very strong electromagnet's magnetic field, the charged ions are bent uh, through a curvature of 90 degrees as they fly down this tube. So remember, the lead atoms have different masses from mass 204 to mass 208. They all have to turn 90 degrees while in this flight tube while passing through the magnetic field. The lightest isotope, lead 204, is turned in the tightest radius, and lead 208 is in the most open radius. It's like turning a corner in a Maserati versus a Mack truck. So when they come out of the magnetic field and have turned 90 degrees, they are now separated into parallel ion beams according to their mass. 204, the 205 we added from the tracer solution, the 206, 207, and 208. So we now have five parallel ion beams moving down the flight tube. We want to count the amount of each of these. We want to measure each of these beams. So we have detectors at the end of the flight tube, one in the position where it will receive the beam from each of these, each of these five beams, 204 to 208 lead. We measure them all simultaneously, and the electrical current that's produced by measuring them uh, is amplified through an amplifier and then goes to a meter and is recorded. And we uh, count, basically, we are counting the intensity of each ion beam, which is proportional to the amount of each isotope of lead that's present. That's what we want to know the amount of each isotope of lead that is present. So we can work back to calculating an age. So a mass spectrometer produces the spectrum of the five masses of lead and counts them all with five detectors and we uh, can calculate the number of atoms in each of those ion beams. Then we do the same for uranium and we then know the number of atoms of uranium-238 and the number of atoms of uranium-235 and their daughter element lead isotopes, and we use uh, a decay equation, the uh, age calculation equation, to calculate um, the time it took, essentially, for that amount of lead to accumulate in that zircon crystal by decay of the uranium. So that's a fairly simple calculation, and it results in one data point, one zircon crystal for which we have the two ages, the two the 238 to 206 radiometric age and the 235 uranium to 207 lead age. The two ages might not exactly agree. One might be 410 million years and the other one might be 409.8 million years, for example, or 410.1 million years. But they should usually agree within hundreds of thousands of years at 400 million years. And they should always agree, if it's a closed system, they should agree within the uncertainties on the two ages that we've calculated. This technique of uranium lead geochronology by thermal ionization mass spectrometry involves chemical separation of the elements we analyze, lead and uranium, and is quite time consuming and requires a very clean chemistry lab and distilled reagents. It is the gold standard in uranium lead geochronology. It gives the most accurate and precise results that are the most trusted. There are other techniques that are faster and more modern, developed more recently. One involves firing a laser beam at the zircon in the mount, like we saw, um, and that laser beam atomizes the sample right there. All the elements are still present, but then they are filtered out in the process uh, in the mass spectrometer, and they separate the peaks from lead and uranium from the other peaks from the rare earths and the zircon and zirconium and can still calculate an age. These are less precise, but they are good for, as a rapid technique if you want to analyze hundreds of zircons, say as detritus from a sandstone. A 
A third technique is long-standing and it's called ion probe analysis and instead of firing a laser beam at the zircon mount, you fire an oxygen ion beam and it excavates a small pit in the sample in the zircon crystal and again uh, atomizes it and again you're measuring all the elements that are present in the zircon but separating in the mass spectrometer the lead and uranium and calculating an age from them. It too is less precise. You're analyzing only a tiny amount of the zircon on the surface instead of the whole crystal like we do, and that's the key reason it's less precise, but it's also commonly used. They are both much faster techniques. Uh, the beam analysis techniques take minutes instead of weeks, uh, but you pay in precision for not spending the time doing the chemical separation.